Amish, you were there at the time and on the ground. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the cultural and artistic milieu of Auckland in the early 1960s? You know, when you're invited to go back uh, to that, which now seems to be an important time, it sounds like a great invitation. But in fact, I've been regretting accepting because it was not a nice time. It was not a good time to read the arts. In fact, it was a very, for I was 22, I just come from Christchurch, and it was a very difficult time. If you had a description of what the art scene in New Zealand was like then, it was factional. Well, the books that weren't factional were fictional. I'll tell you about my first encounter with my. I was sitting at my desk, which was right in front of the library in the office, and uh, Michael walked in and stood there and said nothing. He stood there and said nothing. And I said, can I help you? And he said, no, but you will. <laughs> and then he took a banana out of his pocket, undid the banana, ate half of it, folded it up again, put it back in his pocket and wandered away. I was, quite frankly, terrified. Uh, the art scene then was terrifying, not just for a 22 year old, but for anybody who cared about it. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine Auckland without an art gallery, without an auction house, without exhibitions? Because that's what Auckland was like. It was not a friendly place for artists. If those of you who knew Michael, and I never knew Michael very well, but you knew that he was not an easy person either. And he was the sort of person who was determined to make his own way in the world and to make the world in his own way. And the strange thing about Michael, that the two kind of mysterious presences, if you like, in, in my youth in the arts scene was Tony Passa up north and Michael in the Coromandel. And I thought I'd do a lot, but I could never ever work those two art. But when you saw their works, you were constantly amazed at their singularity. At, um, at their kind of strange presence. And it had never occurred to us that you could actually do art in New Zealand, which was about itself and not about other places. One of the few Michael Lingworths I think that's been exhibited internationally is the Tawara figure uh, on the far wall there, that delightful bread loaf head man um, that is sitting there in his own little world, as Michael Lingworth would say. And this is a work that's very dear to the heart of Linda Tyler here. And she uh, had some association with this work because that work was in a very important exhibition which Linda is going to tell us about now. Yes, indeed. I've had Tawira in the back of my car. And the reason being was that in 1991, I think it was, it could be 1990, I had to drive Robert Leonard, a great colleague of Hamish's and friend and associate, to find... Um, where the Illingworths had been living on the Tapu Corraglin Road because, like Hamish Keith, Robert didn't drive and I was the curator of art collections at the Waikato Museum at the time and the idea was that I would take the work in the back of my car and get it photographed for the Headlands catalogue. Um, the exhibition that was sort of Robert's riposte to the Seven Painters um, kind of like the NZ11 shows that had gone on before. So it was a different take on New Zealand art and he included Tawera, he was very keen to include Tawera because it was a work that he felt was about suburbia and about being boxed in. All of the paintings had been returned from Peter McLeavy Gallery at the end of Michael's life. So in 1988, I think, Peter had just packaged everything up in Wellington and sent it back. So we found Tawira, and it was a bit of a surprise to me to see it with flowers in, in it here, because as it's reproduced in the headlands, you'll notice it doesn't have the flowers in the, in the flower box, which was always intended to, and in fact, in the photographs, from the newspaper, those are the original flowers. So I don't know why. It was probably Robert Leonard's horrible curatorial decision to exclude them, <laughs> the interests of modernism. Doesn't from, quite make sense without them, does it? Without them, does it? No. Yeah. So one of the final uh, you know, period of his life in the 1980s, he used to travel in his battered old Land Rover up from Corriglen all the way up to Matari Bay to visit his old friends. And one of his friends by that stage was the Kawatua in the Iwi in Matari Bay, which is in the far north. 
and he used to stay with Kevin Ireland in Devonport on his way back. It was a two-day trip for him, so he'd drive down from Batari Bay, spend the night with, uh, in Devonport with um, Kevin Ireland, and they'd work their way through a bottle of whiskey and uh, chat away. And in one of those trips, towards the end of his life, he recounted a really beautiful story in which he said that he had been up to visit his friends in Batari Bay and been talking about his art and his journey as an artist throughout his life. He would have been in his early 50s then, I think. Uh, and the local Kaumatua said to him, uh, Michael, you might, know, might not know this, but you yourself are a Kaumatua of the arts. Um, and Michael Illingworth had those words in his ears from the day before when he sat down with Kevin Ireland and said that was the, the most meaningful and the most sort of honoured thing that had ever been said to him and something that he would carry with him uh, for the rest of his days. Uh, and it's been wonderful talking to Dean, uh, Michael's wife, about how committed he was and uh, his care for the land, his relationship with the land, which was something that he returned to New Zealand to, to have in his life along with his life as an artist is something that comes through in both the work and in the archival material there.